Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off with a discussion of the RTX 3080 Ti and 3060. We'll be discussing the release dates as well as specs of both of these upcoming cards. The RTX 3080 Ti is apparently going to be launching in mid-February, uh, most likely coinciding with the Chinese New Year, which takes place between the 11th and 17th of February, although availability will be more likely in late February. And of course, I say availability with air quotes because, well, yeah. Um, this actually is perfectly in line with what I've mentioned several times uh, at this point. Uh, I've mentioned that I originally had been told that the cards were going to launch in January, but then they were pushed back until February. Although, of course, whether this is just because of availability problems or whether this is because NVIDIA have decided to do a small tweak to the specs to fight off better the uh, RX 6900 XT, we don't know. Credit, by the way, to Igor's lab for this information. I'll link his uh, article in the video description. As for the specs, not much has changed. The exact number of CUDA cores, which is found in the RTX 3090, so 10,496. Uh, again, 82 ray tracing accelerators, 328 tensor cores, exactly the same number of ROPs, texture mapping units, all of that stuff. The only difference that we seem to find so far is that the amount of memory and therefore memory bandwidth is cut. So 760 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, thanks to the fact that the bus width is just 320 bits. The memory clock frequency is also said to be identical as well. Although, I will say that generally speaking, Ampere does seem to overclock fairly well for memory. At a guess, I would say that the best way to increase performance on the RTX 3080 Ti will be to crank the memory and then worry about other aspects of the GPU like core clocks later. But, of course, we'll see about that when they actually become available. The card is also said to be considerably cheaper than the RTX 3090, although, given we're still looking at a thousand bucks, it's not exactly cheap. Uh, but then, compared to the 1500 US dollars, which we're looking at for the 3090, well, yeah, I guess it sounds reasonable. Um, meanwhile, the RTX 3060 will have two variants. This, I'm pretty sure, is NVIDIA's strategy to confuse everyone, including itself. A strategy that we saw employed very well with Pascal. So the two variants are based on GA106 and will feature either 12 or 6 gigabytes of memory, depending on the SKU. Now, <laughs> this is very confusing because allegedly even the number of CUDA cores will actually differ. And it won't be a substantial difference, but they will slightly differ. I'll get into the release date first, though. Igor is claiming that the 12 gigabyte model would launch early to mid-January, about the time of CES, but the 6 gigabyte model will launch slightly after that. But another website, Channelgate, they are claiming that the 3060's 6 gigabyte is delayed, meaning it's possible that we'll only see the 12 gigabyte model launch in January. Credit, by the way, as well to videocars.com, which have compiled all of this information. I'll also link their article in the video description. So what does all of this mean? It means pain and confusion. That's what it means. So the 3060 Ti, which I recently reviewed, is an amazing card. It's pretty damn great, assuming you can get it for the MSRP of the Founders Edition. Um, it has 4,864 CUDA cores. And of course, again, um, 38 ray tracing cores, 8 gigabytes of memory, and blah, blah, blah. The 3060, 12 gigabytes, so to be clear, not the TI, that features 3,840 CUDA cores. So we're looking at 1,024 CUDA cores fewer, but the memory goes up because we're looking at 192-bit memory interface, and again, the memory itself actually apparently seems a, sees a clock frequency boost. Um, it's going to be 16 GPPS, but obviously it's still got less bandwidth. But the confusing thing is, the 3060 Ti has 8 gigabytes of memory. This has 12 gigabytes of memory, but the 3060 
we see another cut in the coup de corps count, so 3,584. However, the uh, memory configuration is now just 6 gigabytes, and the memory frequency has also seen a reduction as well. I will also put out, just for your FYI, that the TDP is said to be about 130 watts for the 3060. So for certain systems like small form factor builds, like you're using like the living room, which are primarily going to be doing a little bit of streaming, maybe your game here or there, they could be a nice option. But I do think this is kind of confusing to customers, but there you go. Um, another really exciting update today, actually, and it concerns Kronos Group. Kronos are the chaps behind OpenGL and, uh, well, Vulkan, which is what we're going to focus on here. I recently had an interview with Neil Trevitt, and um, during the interview with Neil, he did discuss a lot of this information that I'm about to go into, um, uh, kind of formally, uh, during the interview, because... Uh, Basically, the way that Kronos work is typically when they are considering extensions to the Vulcan spec, they release them as kind of beta and then eventually become part of the core specification. So we had discussed some of this stuff rather in depth in the interview. I'll link it in the video description if you're interested. Um, and I'll also be going deeper into this in the future because I'm going to be doing a whole series on ray tracing. But for now, let's get into it. So... This is actually really important because with this new update, we even see the RX 6000 series of GPUs able to run Quake 2 RTX. This has been an effort with NVIDIA and many others. So if you own an RX 6800, for example, you can happily buy Quake 2 RTX and run it on your GPU. It is extremely demanding because of path tracing. Just for your FYI, it, it really is demanding. But um, it will run on your on your card, absolutely no problem. And um, I think the best slide to begin with is slide three: Vulcan ray tracing now developer ready. Review and integration of IHV and developer feedback, streamlining layering of DirectX R over Vulcan ray tracing and multiple usability tweaks. And this is the thing. Um, Vulkan does use a lot of layers, so you can enable and disable features as necessary depending on the platform, hardware features, or whatever you're trying to do with the software. And again, because Vulkan is A, GPU agnostic, but B, also software, uh, or rather OS, that's a better way of putting it, OS, like it doesn't care about the OS, and it can run on tons of different hardware, so it can run on um, the Nintendo Switch uses it, the PlayStation 5 doesn't, the Xbox of course doesn't, it uses DXR, uh, sorry, yeah, DirectX, um, whereas naturally uh, PC can use this, it doesn't have to even be like Windows 10, you could have Windows 7 which uses it, it could be, um, I don't know, Linux, whatever. Uh, moseying our way though to slide 4, there's an interesting little thing, I won't spend too long on slide 4, but it does mention that Intel XE HP G -G uh, GPUs will be able to run this as well, they will become available in 2021, so that's more of a tip bit, and in the next slide it also mentions what I just told you about Quake 2 RTX 1.4, which should be available now I believe, I think it's available now. Slide 7, on page 7, is really kind of going out highlighting where Vulkan differs from DirectX 12 and its implementation. Long story short, a major difference is the way that the language for the ray tracing shaders is created, but also the fact that you can build acceleration structures on the host. To be clear, host equals CPU. This means you can offload work from the GPU, which we'll get into actually, well, now. <laughs> In one of the slides, you will notice, and slide 14, how host offload of setup operations. Naturally, how well this kind of carries over to your software or your setup, depending, will really be down to the kind of workload of the engine and also the kind of CPU you're running. A great example of this would be if you're, say, leveraging a 10900K or an, an RX, uh, sorry, an RX, a Ryzen 5950X with tons of threads and cores available, and naturally game typically won't leverage 16 cores, 32 threads, most of the time it will be idle, but imagine if you could instead have those CPU cores, threads, 
do something else. Um, and that would be how this works. So basically you can build the acceleration structure on the host CPU and then that work can be thrown to the GPU. Um, I won't spend too long on this because if you're really technically inclined, I would highly suggest you watch the interview with Neil and I because he explains it really in depth. Um, but this is actually really cool. And I do think that um, it has a ton of potential. Like any API functionality, it's going to really depend on how developers choose to use this. Um, slide 11, I'm kind of flitting backwards and forwards with the slides here, but creating efficient scene geometry. Ray tracing may use huge numbers of rays. Specialized data structures for interrogating geometry. I'm sorry, I kind of feel like it's like the mafia. You know, it's like, did you do it? <laughs> Are you intersecting with a ray? Tell me. Tell me. Are you doing it? Are you the one? Are you the bunny intersecting with this ray? Um, but yeah, being serious for a moment. Uh, the, the bottom line is this is actually really cool. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what how the direction ray tracing is going. It's still really early in the industry for ray tracing adoption. But now that AMD are able to run uh, ray tracing, now that we are able to see uh, ray tracing running on consoles, I don't think it's going to be every single solution ever is ray tracing and ray tracing it's worth noting is not just for visuals it can be used for a plethora of different things including audio uh, positional for stuff for ai tons of things so um how ray tracing is used and different tool sets is going to be I think a subject of a ton of GDC discussions, uh, especially for the next generation consoles over the next couple of years. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing how it evolves. The last thing I'll discuss in this video is the specifications of Rocket Lake. And this has all been compiled by Harakazi5719 on Twitter. I'll link, of course, their tweet in the description of the video. And this is a comparison against Rocket Lake with only several SKUs mentioned, so it's not all of the SKUs. But TLDR, the 11900K and 700K are said to be essentially identical in terms of core count. The major difference seems to be clock frequency. Um, you'll also notice that the L3 cache is just 16 megabytes of the 11900K, which is the same as the 700K, and with eight cores. Uh, and of course 16 threads but this is obviously a different architecture it's utilizing um, essentially like a backport of sunny cove so what we think is that we have 512 kilobytes per l per, of level 2 cache per core which is double that of what we see with um, skylake so yeah the specifications, I think Amy went into a couple of benchmarks yesterday. We're looking at the single boost clock frequencies of 5.3 gigahertz. Though I am hearing some reports that you can hit 5.5, maybe 5.6 gigahertz overclocked. Although I would be rather shocked, honestly, if this is typical behavior for the, GP, for the CPU. Um, the 11600K is a 6-core, 12-thread affair. Um, with 4.9 gigahertz for the uh, single boost and uh, all core boost is just 4.7 uh, compare that to the 4.8 of um, the thermal velocity boost of the 11900k and then bringing up the rear is the 11400 which again is a 6 core 12 thread part with a, a meager base frequency of 2.6 gigahertz although to be fair it's not really going to be hitting base most of the time obviously it'll be hitting, hitting way higher clock frequencies i don't think um there's much to say about this other than i'm looking forward to seeing what rocket lake can bring to the table i just don't necessarily think that uh I don't think it's going to set the world on fire in terms of just general performance. I think it's going to be great for certain workloads. I think video uh, processing, like Adobe Premiere might do quite well on this. Gaming might do quite well on this. The big question for me is going to be, well, first of all, when it releases, will there still be uh, availability issues for Zen 3? For example, the rumor is that it's going to launch February or March, with the more likely being March. Now, are we still going to be seeing availability issues from AMD at that point? If the answer is yes, then this might sell okay, simply because if you need a system, well, you can't buy what's not available. It's really that simple. 
it's a very complicated business conundrum. If you can't buy it, then it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, whether we'll see it available or not, you know, early enough to really take advantage of the shortages. But you know, it's kind of ironic that if Intel had kind of pushed this out a little bit earlier, they they might have done well just simply because availability like no one necessarily is going to be that interested if it gets absolutely decimated in gaming performance but i don't think it will so gamers even if they're roughly even in performance for gaming gamers may opt to go with this with this cpu simply because well gaming performance that's all i care about it's roughly the same i can't buy it amd i give up i just need a platform like you know my system is basically falling apart at this point and the second question, of course, is the pricing. If Intel can put the, C the CPUs out at a decent price, then they might be okay. But if they start charging the same kind of prices that AMD are for the, the say, 5950X, it just isn't going to fly. With all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. Normal stuff, if you have enjoyed the video, of course, subscribe to the channel and also click the bell icon because this is the land of YouTube. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.